and then Anita Hill. And so let's bring on Michael Knowles. Is Michael Knowles there? This is the Daily Wire's own Michael Knowles, the host of the charming host of the Michael Knowles show. Uh, so your your assignment was to rediscover the story of Anita Hill. So let us know what this this because this is the left keeps talking about this. Oh, this is Anita Hill all over again. Let's remember who Anita Hill was and how this came went down. You really give me the worst assignments, Drew. <laughs> I have to, I thought I was getting enough of this looking at Kavanaugh, but uh, so I went back and I I went point by point through the Anita Hill controversy, and I even watched that awful HBO movie oh, that, oh, where man. the left rewrote you history. You took one for the team. I, I took one that. for the team. <laughs> so it's incredible how it all matches up. It just just to refresh our memory, I know it's been a couple decades on a few facts. Uh, this was the same thing. You've got Clarence Thomas, eminently qualified judge. He's up for the seat. And at the 11th hour, at the very last minute, they dredge up some accusations of sexual harassment uh, from when uh, uh, Clarence Thomas was at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and at the Department of Education. Now, what were the accusations? The accusations were not that he had sex with Anita Hill, that he pushed Anita Hill up against a wall, that he dragged her behind a car or went over to her house or anything like that. It's that he made some comments offhand about pornography, that he made comments, uh, particularly lurid comments about things that he found in his Coca-Cola can. This was broadcast to the entire nation. Just tiny sleaze like this. Now, one of the strange aspects of all of this is that Anita Hill uh, followed Clarence Thomas from job to job, from the Equal Employment Opportunity she Commission. Stuck, she stuck with him. She stuck and, with the guy. And, and he never hampered her career in any way. The, never hampered her career, actually promoted her, brought, brought her along with him uh, to his various assignments. This was over the course of years. and But the Democrats glommed onto this. They dragged it up and uh, they, they rooted it out. They brought her to D.C. to testify. This went on and on. Now, one thing that we forget, because Clarence Thomas defended himself very well, he referred to it as a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deigned to think for themselves and who refused to kowtow to an old order. So he used his victim card against their victim That's card. That's right. If, yeah. he, if he looked like Brett Kavanaugh, he, he probably wouldn't he have been able to do that. Yep. <laughs> and, but they did, you know, the Democrats made a very conscious race play here to try to mitigate racial factors. And uh, one thing that was always left out of news reporting about this, and certainly out of the historical record, are all of the employees and colleagues of Justice Thomas, men, women, black, white, and everything in the middle, who uh, test, attest to his character and say Anita Hill was never a victim. She, they were close with her. She never brought this up ever. Nancy Finch, who is a special assistant historian to Thomas at the EEOC, said, there is no way, quote, that Thomas did what Hill alleged. I know he did no such thing. Diane Holt, who was Thomas's personal secretary for six years, said, quote, at no time did Professor Hill intimate, not even in the most subtle of ways, that Judge Thomas was asking her out or subjecting her to crude, abusive conversations that have been described, nor did I ever discern any discomfort when Professor Hill was in Judge Thomas's presence. And, you know, by the way, in the same way that the Republicans have these this optics problem with white men, they had Teddy Kennedy was on the committee that was questioning her. Teddy Kennedy, was he not? It, I, it I, was I, incredible. I, he was on there with his with his dead woman in, in the car. <laughs> and he's questioning Clarence Thomas about his sexual propriety. He's sitting there. You've got Joe Biden is chairing the committee. <laughs> Ted Kennedy is there. And he <laughs> says, you know, well, uh, Judge, uh, did she, uh, did the gale drown? Uh, no, Senator Kennedy. Oh, well, what are we even doing here for that? Uh, so, <laughs> so you've got Kennedy up there. And and it's amazing, by the way, what the movie does to this history. So in the in what really happened. I, before, before you get to that for a minute, let me let me just say that, you know, these things can blow back on people because Andrew Breitbart, obviously the guy who established the Breitbart site and a tremendous conservative warrior, this turned him into a conservative. This was when he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought the left was for black people. I thought they were to there to help black people. And that's when he realized it was all a charade just to get the power. And that was the, that was a wake up call for him. And I think this is going to be a wake up call for a lot of women. You know, women have sons, they have husbands, they have brothers. They do not want them destroyed by this kind of allegation with Without any proof. That's right. And it's all about that precedent. One thing that we're not hearing about too much, and, and we didn't hear about with the Anita Hill story, is the ideological basis of it in Borking, in Robert Bork. They, they uh, Democrats on the committee tried to push that aside. They say it's not about uh, views of the Constitution or textualism or ideology. It's about this 
thing that allegedly happened according to one witness however many years ago before she followed him to another job. There were a couple of other witnesses over time who who came forward and said, I've got allegations, but even the Democrats on the committee didn't consider them terribly <laughs> credible. They were, there were uh, jilted ex-employees and uh, e even they were reluctant to bring them on because they thought it would be a farce. So they, they tried to drag it out. They tried to take as long as they possibly could. You're seeing that, that exactly happen here with the exact Kavanaugh. same strategy. That's it is right. the Anita Hill strategy. They're yeah. ho like at, at some point, hopefully, some woman will come out of the woodwork. And, and that's what they seem to have done with Ronan Farrow. But the way that Hollywood has twisted this is really, is really remarkable. And we should pay close attention because we're watching it play out right now. I watched this terrible, terrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it opens up. You do up. it so we don't have to. That's okay. I did it so you don't have to. And what What's amazing about it is not just so much the facts that they get wrong, though they do get facts wrong. They attribute certain redemptive moments to Ted Kennedy that I assure you never happened, neither in the Anita Hill hearings nor in the life of Ted Kennedy. <laughs> uh, they, uh, you know, other uh, things are attributed to individuals that just didn't, didn't happen. Uh, co characters are made up out of whole cloth, of course. But uh, what's incredible about it is the, uh, the narrative that Anita Hill is this saint that she's this martyr they've made of her the hero of this story when in fact she was a, a pro law professor who uh, made some allegations that at the 11th hour that were refuted by so many other colleagues so the movie opens up and you've got a concerned earnest young woman senate staffer she's not working at the direction of a senator she just wants to find the truth and she calls anita hill and anita hill coincidentally lucky for her she's wearing her yale t-shirt at the time i'm real it's really good because if those cameras caught her in her pajamas it would be very awkward <laughs> and so she's wearing her big yale t-shirt she says hello i don't want to do this but it's my duty and i must testify at the 11th hour to torpedo a good man's career who uh, was my benefactor for much of my career. So she's, uh, you know, she makes these allegations tearfully. She says to her parents that you're going to hear bad things, you know, and, uh, and then it cuts to Thomas and Thomas shows very little emotion. He seems frustrated, but he shows very little emotion. He mentions this to his wife, Ginny, and he, get, he starts, then he, then he starts to raise his voice and she says, don't yell, Clarence. And the implication is clearly he's guilty as sin. The implication is that the wife knew that he was guilty and Anita Hill, she's so honest. The only time that the movie even mentions Robert Bork, even mentions the ideological battle that is undergirding this entire nomination is when Strom Thurmond <laughs> yells out, we need to protect our judge. We don't need another Bork. One of the least sympathetic men <laughs> in yeah, the United yeah, States exactly, Senate. Exactly. You know, this is, this is an amazing thing. You know, I've spent years, years talking to conservatives about the culture and how important it is for us to be part of the culture and how important it is for us to not to say, you know, I'm not going to, there's culture that everybody's cursing and the women are taking off their clothes. I'm just going to watch Turner classic movies. <laughs> but this is why, this is why they own history. That's right. All anybody is ever going to see is that movie. People are not going to go back and read the histories. They're not going to listen, especially with us getting uh, censored on social media <laughs> and they're, you know, uh, jiggering the algorithm so we don't turn up. But, you know, they've done this with everything. You have Valerie Plame scandal, which was an absolute uh, like hit job on non George W. Bush completely. They, they made it into a movie Fair Game, right? And Fair Game, the Valerie Plame was a hero and Joseph Wilson, instead of being what he was, which was a kind of sleazy guy who told a lie and got caught in it, you know, th they became the heroes. And when Joseph Wilson was asked about the fact that nobody was going to see the movie, he was asked about it. This is what he said. He said, for people who have short memories or don't read, this is the only way they will remember the period. And that's true of Fair Game. It's true of JFK, which uh, oh, of in, instead, of, instead of a lone communist killing the president, it was a, a conservative conspiracy. It was true of Argo. That was, won the Oscar. And that was made Jimmy Carter, instead of a feckless, incompetent <laughs> buffoon, it turned him into this noble guy who was going to you know, save, save us from going to war. And it really, they do it. It's so it's why they won't let Melania Trump on any magazine covers. That's the most right. beautiful first lady we've ever had. Graceful. Cannot get. Yes, he cannot get on a cover. They know they know that the culture becomes history just in the same way that history becomes literature, just becomes a story in the same way. 
Culture becomes history, and they know it. I'm going to let you uh, finish. We got just a little bit of time, so you can wrap it up. Well, they won't. The, the, I think the big takeaway is they won't paint with a subtle brush. At the end of this movie, you've got some fictional character and other fictional characters saying, "You know, we, it, it's all been discredited. Clarence is going to go through." She says, "Well." Who do you believe? And then she, the girl turns to the camera, windswept hair. I believe her. <laughs> Audience, in case you missed it, believe her. It's, and, we, and the conservatives have to fight back on this cultural front. All right, Knowles. Thanks very much. The Michael Knowles of The Michael Knowles Show. It is always good talking to you. I'll talk to you later. See you later. This is it. The culture, the culture rewrites history, and that lasts forever. Culture lasts. Life is short, but art is long. And that is what they know, and they use it to their advantage, and we should be in that business too.